ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you already know, our guests today are Karen Wien and Paul Bloom. Karen, Paul, hello. Uh, and uh, yesterday uh, we talked about the place of emotions uh, in the architecture uh, of the human mind. Today, uh, our goal is a bit different. I would like to talk with you about the role of emotions in the constructions, uh, or construction of human societies. Uh, yesterday, our guide uh, was a famous philosopher, uh, René Descartes, and today I would also like a famous philosopher to be our guide in this inquiry, uh, and this time it will be David Hume. Uh, and there are two interrelated problems uh, which were raised by David Hume. Uh, two problems I would like to uh, speak about. The first, and we've already, uh, uh, we've already heard a bit about that, is the problem of the origin of morals uh, and also other social institutions and the role of emotions in this evolutionary process. Uh, the other problem, which is connected to the title of uh, today's talk, uh, today's discussion, Hume's guillotine, uh, is uh, Hume's claim that facts do not determine the norms of behavior. There is no passage from is, from what is the fact, to what we ought to do. So if you allow me, I would start with the first of those problems, the origins of uh, morals and what science says about the sources and nature uh, of morality. And I uh, will start by quoting uh, Hume uh, from uh, a treatise of human nature, where he says, uh, take any action allowed to be vicious, willful mur murder, for instance. Examine it in all lights and see if you can find that matter of fact or real existence which you call vice. In which, whichever way you take it, you find only certain passions, motives, volitions and thoughts. There is no other matter of fact in the case. The vice entirely escapes you as long as you consider the object. You never can find it till you turn your reflection into your own breast and find a sentiment of disapprobation which arises in you towards this action. Here is a matter of fact, but this the object of feeling, not of reason. And my first very general question is whether Hume is simply right, plainly wrong, or somewhere in between. What do you think, Karen? Well, I think maybe part of that depends on whether you believe in a god or not that's prescribing some system to create an objective moral truth. Um, I myself in, am inclined towards that Hume is right, the truths reside within us and our value system. I do think you know, the quote about or the point about um, in any fact, there's just an is, there's what is, but you can never get from what is. What is will never tell you what must be nor what should be. And you can kind of go two directions with that or one conclusion from that is when we have a what should be or a what must be, we haven't got that from the empirical world. We have got it from inside of ourselves. Um, we've created it. Uh, and the other then turns to the question, when we are grasping to try to create our own moral codes for the things we're not sure of, um, what do we appeal to to get those? Uh, and, and that, I think, is a very difficult and, and many-pronged question. Oh, maybe. Um, I'm glad you started with Hume, because Hume is, is one of my favorite philosophers. He's utterly brilliant, clear, energetic. He's a wonderful writer and a deep thinker. And I think he was interestingly wrong in just about everything he said um, about, about metaphysics, about morality, about the mind. I mean, I should be so wrong in my career as him, as so wonderfully, brilliantly wrong. Um, so I don't believe in God. I don't think there is a God. And yet, I'm a moral realist in a way that Hume rejects in that passage you gave. I think slavery, for instance, is wrong. Now, it's true to say this requires making certain premises, 
about the value of certain things and so on. But this is true for everything. Every, every system from logic to mathematics to induction itself, as Hume pointed out, rests on premises that we can't ourselves justify. So I don't actually think that what makes things right or wrong is a matter of our sentiments. I think, for instance, we could believe as a population that something is morally okay, as most people believed about slavery, and be mistaken and be overturned by facts later on. But we can all also read this passage as saying something different. Uh, saying simply that if we think of morality, of what is the nature of morality, uh, we will never find what that is uh, if we turn our attention to reason. Uh, what is the foundation of our moral action, of our moral judgment, are the, uh, what Hume calls sentiments, so what we would probably call emotions or feelings or uh, more generally affects. So maybe on this count, Hume is right. Well, I think not all of our sentiments are created equal. We have some that we hold much deeper than others. So if I make a mathematical analogy, uh, any system of mathematics has some unproven assumptions at its core. We've got the piano axioms, we've got Euclidean geometry, and uh, I'm not the first person to suggest, uh, I think perhaps my mentor from my undergraduate days, John McNamara, a psychologist at McGill University. He was a wonderful man. Um, but he was I, perhaps the first to suggest that, that we have a, perhaps a fundamental moral calculus of some unproven principles. Uh, and then people like Jonathan Haidt and others have made it their business to try to un unpack and articulate what are the core moral principles that are universal to all societies. And then the task is, in any particular society, hashing out how those specific fundamental principles of, you know, thou shalt do no harm, for example, or it's wrong to harm, is a particularly profoundly universal one. Um, how do you cash them out when you have co competition between different harms and, and, you know, those, that's the hard work, but but it may be of a work that's sort of of the nature of mathematics where you're trying to arrive at a proof and philosophers are there getting in the trenches, thinking really hard and making the logical arguments and perhaps it's, that's the process. So I very much agree with my colleague. Um, I, I, I think it's really critically important here to make a distinction between moral judgments and moral actions. For moral judgments, I think, as Karen pointed out, you can run them through without emotion, without sentiment. I could be a utilitarian, for instance. My premise is the greatest good for the greatest number. And then I could say, well, slavery is bad because, and then make an argument. You might want to make a counter argument, we go back and forth. Or we could be Kantians and argue about moral principles. But we can run this through with reason, with rationality. And I think, and I'll talk tomorrow, that we definitely should run it through. When we rely on our emotions, it's a disaster. However, Hume, is, Hume has been right about many things, and he was certainly right, as you pointed out, about moral action. I can decide through reason that slavery is wrong, but simply knowing that is, is motivationally empty. I'll sit around and watch it. I'll participate in it. Who cares if it's wrong, I say. So Hume is correct that you need some sort of kick in the pants not his term, some sort of emotion, emotional drive, compassion, love, anger, outrage, to motivate the system. He's right that the line about reason is and can only be the slave of the passions is, when it comes to action, correct. Uh, I think I have, a, I have a quotation which summarizes the, what, what you said quite nicely. It's a, a quotation from Shakespeare, from The Merchant of Venice. Uh, in which one of the characters says, uh, if to do were as e easy as to know what were good to do, chapels had been churches and poor men's cottages princes' uh, palaces. It is a good divine that follows his own instructions. I can easier teach 20 what were good to be done than be one of the 20 to follow my own teaching. The brain may devise laws for the blood, but a hot temper leaps over a cold decree. Uh, 
so, so maybe that's what we are talking about. So uh, we can design very complex abstract systems of morality. We can argue with each other uh, using the arguments uh, elaborated by famous philosophers or uh, some arguments we uh, design ourselves. Uh, uh, but if this is disconnected from a lower level and a level which is founded on our emotional reactions, uh, this kind of morality would be empty. Would you agree with this yeah. rendering of your I, I, I wouldn't say disconnected, but I mean, I am entirely convinced in part by my wife about the moral importance of vegetarianism, to be a vegetarian. I, am, I find arguments very persuasive. And yet I just finished off half of a chorizo and pepper sandwich. Um, there's a gap between my moral beliefs and my moral action. And for many of us, it's, it's, it's a difficult gap to, 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 to make. So, uh, would you agree with, with me saying that uh, morality without emotions would be impossible? That, that's the first I would think part of the question. Moral judgments without emotions are entirely possible, like mathematical intuitions, like scientific judgments, and everything like that. Moral actions without yeah. emotions would indeed be impossible. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Uh, We're making things easier for the translators. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, when we look at the problem from the evolutionary perspective, uh, I would assume that the first thing that emerged was moral action or something we, we can uh, term moral action. And moral judgment is something which emerged only later in our evolutionary history. Uh, or uh, if this would be the case, uh, then my argument is, uh, without the earlier evolutionary stages, so without all the emotional mechanisms standing behind moral action, uh, mo moral judgment as such would never have materialized. Well, speaking developmentally, moral judgment comes first. The moral action, I mean, basically, if it's good for you and it's moral, you know, you're just operating you know, you don't need to appeal to morality for why people are doing it. And if it's moral and it's not good for you, but in some other interest, developmentally, that's where kids, you know, they, they don't have the same amount of self-regulation that it takes to overturn something that they want. If they want the cookie and they're a little bitty kid and they know it's somebody else's and they're supposed to share, just that moral knowledge isn't going to be enough to cause the action. But they've got the moral judgment from as early as we have looked. So, um, you know, humans are such a hyper-social species. We're so incredibly social and have built up these in incredible amounts of cooperation with complete strangers, even now on other countries, towards common goals and enterprises. We could never have done all that um, without a lot of trust in fellow humans and a lot of motivations to honor the trust in other fellow humans, which includes them being able to catch us out when we transgress because they have the apparatus of moral judgment and we have the apparatus of moral judgment. That, that has to go back, to my mind, way of thinking, as far back in our evolutionary history as the moral actions and, and that the moral actions have largely resulted from our need to be trusted and accepted by others who are morally judging creatures. So I would, I would push back on that conclusion that action came first. Yep. yep. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, a question which is not directly connected to morality, to the, the emergence of morality, to the nature of moral action or moral judgment, uh, but to some other fields in which you d did some very important research, which is uh, mathematical cognition and language. Uh, uh, do you think that emotions play any role in those two spheres uh, of human experience? Because uh, if I think of mathematics, uh, I would probably say, okay, you, you, if you want to find uh, something which is as disconnected from emotions as possible, you would probably point to mathematics. 
Well, let me take the mathematics and I'll let you take the language. But and I will say um, yup at the end. <laughs> well, now that you're going to say yup, I could just say anything. <laughs> um, yeah, certainly mathematics is, has been developed as a result of principles of logic and sort of very, you know, systems of thought and logic and, you know, formulaic proof. So I, but I wouldn't say it has no, I think what it has driven a lot of people to, to dedicate their lives to mathematics is, you know, the incredible beauty. Uh, there is something just so, all right, I'm a nerd, so maybe it's the nerd in me speaking, but there's something just so incredibly sexy <laughs> and amazing about a formalized system of, uh, I mean, mathematics is all kinds of amazingly crazy things that are so beautiful. And you're right, it's not like, oh, let me just go create some stuff. It's, it's got these constraints, but uh, we, I don't think we ever would have developed the systems anywhere near as far if they, again, the emotions are the motivators and you, mathematics as a pure system goes much farther than all the parts of mathematics that actually are useful. There's a whole lot of totally useless stuff that only got created because it's just people find it incredibly beautiful and moving. Well, uh, s some researchers would say that uh, it would be impossible to develop culture in general, so including mathematics, but also morality and other social institutions, without some social emotions. Uh, you mentioned trust, uh, 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 which we put in others. So uh, in order to cooperate, so it would, would be impossible to create science and you know, all the technology we created without cooperation. And cooperation seems to be something which presupposes uh, or, or requires uh, some social emotions, some attachment to the other people uh, and so on. Would you uh, see this role of emotions in the evolution of, of, of human cultures? Absolutely. Um. Certainly, we have a deep-seated desire to be accepted by others and not to be ostracized, to be thought well of, therefore to, to do the things that are needed to do to be on the in, on the ins of our, of our social group, not on the outs. And what about, uh, what about language? I, mean, I agree with, with, with all of that, but we have to be careful here. I mean, emotion is incredibly important, central to so many activities. But we don't want to fall into the trap of whenever somebody mentions anything, say, oh, that must involve emotion. That, in some way, when you do that, emotion becomes a lot less interesting. It sort of loses its special flavor, loses its distinctive and important qual qualities. So again, I think we need to make some distinctions. Mathematical reasoning, uh, solving a proof, for instance, can be done through an entirely mechanistic process. Um, language processing the creation of grammatical trees, syntax, phonology, morphology. The best theories of how this is done make no appeal at all to emotion. And, to extend, and, and the processes of mathematics and language can and are simulated by my iPhone, by laptop computers that don't have any emotion in it. I think there are computational processes quite separate from emotion. Having said that, certainly, as Cameron pointed out, math, mathematicians are motivated by emotion. You may want to do a mathematical proof because of ambition or, or, you know, Professor Damasio listed all sorts of emotions that drive accomplishments in art. You could have a similar list for mathematics, you know, you, you want to get some sex, you want to get rich, you want to humiliate your enemies. Those are the standard three. Um, and, and for language, although the, 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 the computational system of language, I think Chomsky's correct here, is autonomous in a sense. The reason to use language, the desire to use language, is of course heavily laden with emotion because it's motivation like no other. But again, I think there's a theme emerging here, which is a need to distinguish certain processes that are separate, that are computational, that don't apply uh, uh, emotion, from what makes us act upon them. Do a proof produce a sentence, make a threat, uh, show off my mathematical argument, and that's laden with emotion. Uh, okay, uh, so let us num uh, now come back to uh, morality and the deve moral development of a human being. So uh, Karen, uh, in her beautiful presentation, showed 
more or less where a human being starts, where, where, where is the beginning of the moral development. Uh, but how to get from a, a just kid uh, to a, a full-blooded moral agent? At least some of us are, I think, uh, moral agents. What's the tra trajectory here? I'm going to let you answer. <laughs> All right, well, well, you take this uh, it, I mean, it, it's, it's an extraordinarily important research program. There are a lot of people, like Karen, doing this extraordinary work on what our moral foundations are. And there's a lot of people, actually also like Karen, who study adults and, and adult moral reasoning. And, it's, and my talk tomorrow is going to be mostly about adult moral reasoning. But how do you get from one to the other? I think it, it um, nobody knows is the, the basic answer, but I think the answer will involve the capacity to move beyond sentiments and responses and apply reflection. Repl reflection either as individuals, where I think about myself, I, I struggle to figure out the right thing to do, or even better in groups, where I say, you know, I have every right to cheat on the exam because it's important for me to, to get an A. And you say, that wouldn't be fair to other people. And I say, but they have an unfair advantage. And we go back and forth. And three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds do this. They argue. So much of the daily conversation of young children is about issues that are moral. Is it, is it OK to download music without paying? Was it fair for the teacher to punish the student that way? So much of the discussions we have as adults, what we often dismiss as gossip, is moral. And I think through this discussion and debate, which requires language, which requires the capacity for reflection, which requires social abilities, certainly requires emotion, that's what pulls us up. And I would just add a couple of things to that list, right? Our ability to take the perspective of another. Perspective taking is really important. Our cognitive capacity to entertain counterfactuals, right? Like, um, what if I were to have done this other thing? Or what if this person were to do something else? And our ability to kind of, um, read forward into possible futures, like to follow chains of action into their likely future consequences. We need to be able to have all of those cognitive capacities to take the abstract reflection, okay, what if the shoe were on the other foot? Wait a minute, I've articulated this general principle to myself. Maybe it's a utilitarian principle. Maybe it's something else. Treat uh, unto others as they would have, you'd have them do unto you, or maybe it's everybody should get the same number of cookies, whatever abstract principle, you know, you need these things to be able to have that level of abstract, uh, abstraction of thought and, and then be able to compare the current reality scene to that and see what needs to be done to meet it or where it's fallen short. And, and then there's a huge role, clearly, of culture and experience and the values that you are being raised in that your community and your family hold dear. Um, and, and that's where, you know, there's, there's a huge amount of the heavy lifting just by showing that there is some pretty considerable basis for our moral thinking present, you know, very early on in development is not to say there's not a, a very considerable role of experience and cultural input in how we translate and, and as Jonathan Haidt and others have, sh have shown, even which values we decide to prioritize over other ones when they conflict. Uh, I wonder what are the limits of the or possible limits of this process. So for instance, when I think of the, one of the greatest moralists of all time, Immanuel Kant, quite obscure sometimes, but, uh, but great nevertheless, uh, he would say that one should act if one wants to act morally. One should act according to a maxim for which he or she would like to become a universal law of nature. What this means is that uh, acting morally is acting out of duty only. So the only motive for action uh, is that this is my moral duty. So I need to disregard all kinds of feelings, emotions, whether this gives me pleasure or not, whether this, uh, there is some profit in it for me or not, and so on and so on. So this is a very high standard of moral uh, action. Uh, can we achieve it as, as human beings? Is, is it the limit or, 
or it's impossible on a daily basis at least? At least? It's a good question. I would say it's impossible. I think that, that, that where, you know, there, there's a line from this, uh, this uh, anthropologist, uh, Audrey, um, which is that we are born of risen apes, not fallen angels. And I think we could come to great moral insights. We could create societies and cultures that direct us to do good things. But I think as individuals, we're always going to have appetites. We're always going to have motivations. We're always, you know, we're, we're not entirely moral creatures. I'm not even sure, and some philosophers like Susan Wolf have said, is it really the best aspiration to be a fully moral person? That's it, a moral saint. There's other, there's other things in life. <laughs> yeah, I, li I, I like the line, we're from, risen from eight, not, not fallen angels, um, better than the line I was thinking uh, too long, you know, a man's reach should exceed his grasp and reach for the stars that way when you fall short you get the moon, right? We're, as long as we have self-interest, which we are, you know, is every bit as fundamental to our nature as anything else we've been talking about, there's going to occasionally arise conflict, conflict between our principles and our personal interests and the nature of conflict is it's not going to 100% go only one way. There's going to be compromises and falling short. And um, I do think there are circumstances, whether they be cultural or whether they be personal, that facilitate being able to make the compromises in favor of your principles to a greater extent as opposed to a lesser extent. And that obviously our task, those of us who want a fair and just and equitable society, uh, the task is to try to construct a world where, where those sort of, that sort of compromise is, is made easy and is supported and where we're um, enabling people to transcend, you know, the really strong need to just be taking care of their own selves at all costs. But we also know there's huge individual differences, um, some of them even genetically based in terms of people's social cognition, the extent to which they care about other humans, just want to live their own lives as hermits off in the woods somewhere, um, and, and for many other reasons. So we're going to, you know, there's never, we're never going to achieve the utopia, but we can always strive towards it. Well, I, I think that a good way to summarize this part of our discussion is a, a quote for, from Paul's new book, Against Empathy, uh, where you say, we have gut feelings, but we also have the capacity to override them to think through issues, including moral issues, and to come to conclusions that can surprise us. I think this is where the real action is. Uh, it's what makes us distinctively human, and it gives us the potential to be better to one another, to create a world with less suffering and more flourishing and happiness. And that, that's beautiful. I, I, yep. <laughs> Uh, but now I would like to uh, uh, move to the second topic. Uh, we try, or you tried, to reconstruct uh, a rough outline of uh, how our moral uh, actions and moral judgments are possible. But now the question is whether this knowledge, the knowledge we have, uh, some knowledge we have about the mechanisms behind the human morality can inform our moral choice. So we move from facts, from what the science says about uh, morality, uh, to normative questions, to questions of uh, uh, what should we do. And I believe that we will probably agree with Hume, who says that there is no logical uh, link between descriptive sentences, sentences saying what is the case uh, to norms of behavior, uh, but maybe uh, the more knowledge we have about the underpinnings of human morality, uh, the better our moral choices may be. Can you comment on this? Well, I, like I said earlier, I agree with Hume that you're never going to get from an is to either an ought in the case of morality or a, a must in the case of mathematics. Um, 
yet we know, you know, my previous work with number was that human babies know that one and one must make two, um, even though if they've observed it, they're only observing the is that it does make two. Uh, I, I feel the same holds for our, our fundamental moral, our really fundamental core moral principles or moral intuitions are not going to be proven ones. They're not ones that we've observed and turned into oughts. Um, at the fundamental level, they're oughts that come from within us. You're, you know, we can't get them from outside. I think the question you're asking is then, how do we go further? How do we go beyond the really basic ones to articulate them either at a more abstract level or a more explicit level or a more universal level? Um, <clears throat> How do we elaborate? I mean, our human society is incredibly complex and we need a, a very extended codes. We know our legal code diverges from our moral code left and right all over the place. You can't track the moral code legally um, in, in, you know, and, and we often don't even want to. You know, it shouldn't be illegal to, to lie to somebody except in constrained situations. Uh, so, it, it, I think it's there. It, it's a good question. <laughs> How do we do it? So uh, I don't have a deep answer. I, I, I agree with everything Karen said. I'll just sort of expand a bit. Uh, I mean, Hume is right. If I want to know whether about the morality of sexism or slavery or capitalism or death penalty, you don't find out the morality by asking 100 people. And you certainly don't find out by asking 100 babies. You don't, you know, you don't, you can't, from people's judgments, from the facts of psychology, you can't derive moral truth. But you're also right that psychology does have a lot to say to moral, about morality. I can think of at least two ways in which it can. One is, you mentioned Immanuel Kant. And Immanuel Kant pointed out correctly that to say you ought to do something implies you're capable of it. I wouldn't say you're morally obligated to fly around the world in a second and feed everybody, because you can't. Um, psychology, the sort of psychology that Karen talked about today, could tell us a lot about what humans are capable of, and therefore, what we can ask of them. Can we ask you to give your kidney to a stranger? Can we ask you to care about, about uh, a child in Africa as you would care for uh, a child you love in your own life? So it could constrain things in that way, and that could be really relevant. A second thing, and this is what I'll be talking about tomorrow, but is, is a general interest, is a lot of our moral decisions, our normative moral decisions, are driven by the emotions. I feel gratitude, I feel shame, guilt, uh, empathy, disgust. But psychologists could unpack these emotions, and they have unpacked these emotions. The case of disgust is something I've always been interested in. Many people, maybe even many people in a room, might say, look, such and so is wrong. Why do you think it's wrong? Because it's disgusting. About, say, the sexual behavior I see. It's wrong because it's disgusting. Well, psychologists can and have unpacked disgust. Why do we feel disgust? And there's now, I think, very good evidence that disgust is, is uh, built out of a response to pathogens, but it has nothing to do with morality in a reflective way. And if that's correct, and it's an empirical psychological claim, then from a moral point of view, if you say, I think homosexuality is wrong because it disgusts me, a psychologist could respond, we now know that that's not a good moral guide. Maybe, it's, maybe you have another argument, or listen to another argument, but disgust itself is an unreliable moral guide. So psychologists could unpack where our moral thoughts come from and in that way come to some normative conclusions. So it, it would be right to say that there are two ways in which our knowledge of those emotional or affective mechanisms uh, in our organisms, in our brains, uh, uh, help us to, to inform our moral action. Uh, the first one is that, in a way, set limits to what is possible to a human being. The other direction is that they uh, may identify obstacles in exercising a real moral judgment. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, okay, I, I think, if you don't mind, it's time to give our audience a chance to ask a few questions. Um, I'd like to connect uh, your talk, your early talk, Professor, with uh, what you were talking about um, 
uh, more recently and ask, aren't we sort of doomed as societies uh, simply because uh, those uh, more primitive uh, sentiments are stronger because they are sort of hardwired. Um, they are um, earlier, um, both in evolutionary terms and our uh, individual uh, developmental terms. So um, let's say prejudice and those preferences uh, towards similarity uh, will always win. And um, yeah, that's sort of it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for asking that question. Um, there's two things I want to say in response. Uh, one of them is that they don't always win. Um, our approbation for those who treat others well and our approbation of good behavior uh, in a number of our studies is at least as strong as our preference for others who are similar to us. And if you pit them directly against each other, we haven't done that, but in our memory studies, uh, it looks like we actually, babies actually, hold in memory much longer who's nice and who's mean than, than who's similar and who's different from them. Though in the very short run, it looks like they may care more about who's similar and different, but they forget it quicker. Um, but the deeper thing that I want to say is, I, you know, there is a silver lining that I think we can exploit to our benefit in that if we are stuck with a system, as we are, that fundamentally prioritizes or values similarity and devalues difference, um, if there's a system that says difference is different from me is bad, that system equally says similar to me is good. And while there's a lot of superficial ways in which different cultures and different subgroups and subcommunities differ from each other, all humans around the world share a lot of similarities in common. We're similar to each other at, in much deeper ways than our differences. And where you see communities that have been divided learning to unite or deciding to unite and suddenly viewing each other not as enemies but as allies is when they're usually when they're reminded that they have some common enemy. Um, but that, you know that's a similarity, right? It, it, there's many different ways that we can be brought to view someone as belonging to our group in some type of a way or another, being like us in some form. And so actually some of my studies that I am pursuing and interested in pursuing next involve you know, how we can use this type of messaging and, and as early interventions being reminded or <laughs> repeatedly trained in these facts to think about humans, other humans in this way as, you know, we all love our children, we all want a roof over our heads, we all want safety. There's profoundly basic ways in which we're all the same. And that being taught to think this way may be a very potent intervention that may be one of the most powerful cultural encouragements to a more globalized world that, you know, that we have been seeing develop over the last, if you compare where we are now to what social life looked like 500 years ago, you know, we're a much, we're a much safer and, and more just world today. I, I love that answer, and I'll, I'll expand upon what Karen said at the very end of it. Um, um, it's a really interesting and surprising fact that we don't seem to be doomed. It's, 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 it's a great question, like why not? But we don't seem to be doomed. People like, uh, scholars like Peter Singer and Robert Wright and Steven Pinker have captured the fact that over human history, we've been treating each other better and better and better. This seems surprising to many people since we're often terrible to each other right now. But, but if you look at, say, the extent of murder, it's dropped over time. So that the last century, which seems horrific, was actually more peaceful than one before that and more peaceful than one before that. Um, we, you see right now for moral virtues, when I was a child, most people in my country thought interracial marriage should be outlawed. Most people in my country thought that gay people were criminals. 
Most people in my country thought that men and women uh, should have radically different roles and women should be punished for trying to take men's roles. There are still people who might hold those views, but they're a diminishing minority. And we've been getting better and better. And one way to explain this, and this is sort of a, 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 sort of a, a, a different way of capturing what Karen was talking about, is we have a duality. There's two parts to us, a point from Plato on, which is we are creatures of sentiments, what you find in the babies. We're also creatures of rationality. And our rationality can feed into culture and government so that we have a world where we all sit together and listen to each other and argue, and we don't try to beat each other to death. And, uh, and it's, so we're, we're not apparently doomed, unless, of course, um, we are, and something bad happens. Well, we still have time for a couple of questions. A question here, and then the last question there. Mnie zainteresowało to, co pan mówił o odrazie jako kryterium przy moralności. I tak wspominając wczorajszy wykład, gdzie mieliśmy podany ładny przykład rozróżnienia emocji i uczuć, to tak się zastanawiam, czy przypadkiem myśl, mówiąc o odrazie, o czymś odrażającym, nie warto podjąć definicję, co jest podstawą odrażania, że coś jest odrażające. Względy estetyczne i wtedy na przykład budzą się nasze emocje i to są wtedy wzorce naszych zachowań, czy też to jest uczucie odrażające, które wtedy świadczy o naszym człowieczeństwie, czymś głębokim i wtedy jest to bliższe moralności i niezależne, tak, związane z człowieczeństwem i w związku z tym, tak mi się skojarzyło, że wtedy, gdy myślimy o emocjach i o tej odrazie, to są kategorie segregacji ludzi i wtedy ta empatia w ogóle jest niedobra, o której tutaj Pan y, mówi. Natomiast kiedy odraza jest o, oparta o uczucia, czyli coś, co jest związane z człowieczeństwem, wtedy może da się połączyć w praktycznym wymiarze Emanuela Kanta. Tak, czyli że on jest, że, że można to zastosować, nie mówię, że łatwe, że jest trudne, ale że jakby to mogłoby być ten praktyczny wymiernik, w jaki sposób możemy moralność praktycznie zastosować. I w związku z tym pytanie jest, czy, bo to była taka opowieść też, tylko czy pytanie jest, czy właśnie traktując jako odrazę, biorąc jako kryterium odrazę do podjęcia decyzji moralnych, czy to przypadkiem nie jest tak, że potrzebujemy się zastanowić, co wywołuje tą odrazę, co jest przyczyną. Estetyka, czyli emocje, piękno, moja wrażliwość, jakaś wynikająca na przykład z wzorców kulturowych, czy też głęboka moralność, człowieczeństwo oparte na uczuciach, czyli coś, co wczoraj tutaj pan profesor nam ładnie rozróżnił. Co państwo na to, jestem ciekawa. So the question, I'm going to paraphrase um, for, for the English speaking people in the audience, uh, as I understand it is, uh, is when we have an emotion or, or such as disgust, um, do we have to kind of just dismiss it as a, an emotion and therefore that it doesn't fundamentally have a moral base or might there be occasions where it really has a moral base and we need to do the heavy work to unpack what is causing dis us to, you know, to discuss to rise in this case. And I'll give you my shorter answer and I think probably Professor Bloom will have something to say as well, but I, I think whenever we have an emotion um, that is spurring us to make a moral judgment about someone, we always want to be asking, what's, what's giving rise to that emotion? What's giving rise to my, my outrage here, my disgust there? Could it really be self-interest? Is it really 
an extension of my systems for detecting germs and you know rotting meat that are now zooming off ahead of me into some you know thing where I don't want them to go uh, and so on. Is it a fundamental moral principle that's been violated? Uh, and, and then we do that heavy work of why am I feeling this way so that we can then know how we want to act on our feelings. And I think it's a good question. I think for disgust, we could answer it. For a while, people like uh, the philosopher Leon Cass and some others argued there's a wisdom to disgust. Many people feel repugnance at the idea of uh, gay men having sex or years ago, interracial couples having sex. Um, and Cass said, maybe it's really smart, maybe it's something, something deep that our rationality can tap. Now to me, this, and this goes back, this is an empirical question. How does disgust work in the brain? And I think there's now fairly decisive evidence that this view, though plausible, is mistaken. The primary things that elicit disgust are urine, feces, blood, vomit, and rotten meat. Everywhere those elicit disgust. Other things that elicit disgust, to the extent they're associated with it, parts of the body associated with defecation, urination, uh, uh, the idea of a person being unwashed. Um, and it gets extended to, to vilified outgroups. If you're uh, um, a German in the 1940s, you might find Jews disgusting. If you're an American, a white American at the time of slavery, you might find blacks disgusting. If you're a, a man of a certain sort and certain religious training, you'll find women disgusting. But it doesn't seem to reflect wisdom. It seems to reflect cultural associations between things that are, involve pathogens and certain groups of people. And so I think we have the answer, but I also want to commend you. That's exactly the right question to ask, and that's an illustration of your point in, in, in response to Hume, that psychology can bear on these questions in good ways. And the final question. Now, you all accepted eagerly uh, the Humean rule that there is no passage from is to ought. Uh, I think you are wrong, uh, and Hume is wrong. Let me give uh, an example. If, I have a, if my wife is uh, in pain, she has a strong headache, and my child comes and uh, is very noisy, I don't have to go and say, look, you shouldn't do it. Don't be noisy. It's quite, enough, it's quite enough for me to state certain fact. I go and say, look, your mother is ill. Your mother has a headache. I don't use any odd, you should not do it, and so on. And he already knows what to do. So it seems that there is quite clear passage from is to what. Um, so that, that's a lovely example, but I think there's still a missing step, and you trust your child to make that step. Suppose your child was quite different. Your child said, so what? So what? My mother has a headache. My noise is causing her pain. So, what's your point? Right, what about the 20%? The 20%, they're not stupid. You imagine this child being a genius. The child says, I understand all the facts, but what are you getting at? And you say, well, don't you understand your noise is driving your mother batty? And the child says, I understand that perfectly. And then you might say to your child, don't you understand the utilitarian idea that you shouldn't cause people pain? And the child says, I've studied utilitarians. I'm a philosopher, says the child. I still like making noise. And what the child is lacking is a moral sense and not an understanding of some facts. At least I would think so. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think the way I read your anecdote of your son, it was a son, right? But who, whichever, um, is the, the ought isn't there in the world. It's just the is. Your wife is feeling it's, you know, ill and have a headache. Your child is providing the ought. Um, the ought is coming from the child. My mother has a headache, I care about her, my noise is causing her pain, therefore, I should not make noise because I don't want to cause pain.
No, my point was simply that uh, uh, there is, it seems that in this, in this anecdote, uh, ought is already included in is somehow. And the rule is that there is no passage from is to uh, ought. So the anecdote just says that there is, uh, maybe mysterious, but some interesting connection between, between is and ought, contrary to the rule that you so eagerly accept. I mean, to, to be fair, there, there are complexities here that we should be conscious of. Um, John Cyril points out that some fa certain factual statements seem to carry with the moral implications. If it's true that you promised to drive me home, if that's true, then one might say, all things being equal, you ought to drive me home. And that, and that it follows from what promise, what it is to make a promise. And you could imagine cases like that. But still, I think for the most part, it's hard to imagine, to go back to what we were talking about, it's hard to imagine you know, scientists doing a whole lot of research of to what way things really are, and from that, deriving moral truths in a direct way. Uh, okay, our, our, our time is almost up, and I need to say two things. Uh, the first is, uh, I would like to remind you that tomorrow at 7, in the same beautiful hall, Professor Bloom will deliver his lecture against empathy. The second thing is a question I was forced to ask uh, by Bartek Kucharczyk. Uh, Karen, are, are you also against empathy? <laughs> Wait a minute, he already asked me that, or somebody. <laughs> uh, so, um, hmm. So, yeah. No, no, no I, simple yup. No. Pardon? No simple yup. Well, I see its good points and its flaws. I'll let Professor Bloom give his whole lecture tomorrow to describe its flaws, which it has many. Uh, it does play a positive role as well. So I think uh, you can't just s be simply for it or against it 100%. Okay, uh, Karen. <laughs> but stay tuned for, for the argument that it you just, I, I, it just I think you can be for <laughs> or against it 100%. And I think there's one of the ways you should be. So th this was the warm-up for tomorrow. Uh, Karen, Paul, thank you very much for today's discussion.